welcome to the Everyday Miracles podcast, where real life stories of hope and inspiration are shared. Every day, miracles are happening all around us, yet we rarely hear anything about them. Why is that? I'm Julie Hedenborg, and I've committed my time and energy to bring these stories to you, including some of my own personal experiences. My hope is that you'll be impacted the same way that I was. Join me in my journey to inspire change in a world that so desperately needs it. Hey, welcome back. This is Julie with Everyday Miracles Podcast. And today I am so happy. I have a guest that is a friend of one of my dearest friends, Maria. I won't say her last name because she's really, really private. <laughs> but thank you, Maria, for connecting me to Jane Harris today. She's known Jane for 13 years. And Jane is a social worker out of Bristol, Tennessee. And she has a beautiful testimony that she's going to share with us today about a walk she took with Jesus. It was a supernatural experience and um, happened during a surgery that she had. So Jane, welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi everyone. I wanted to let you know my story and my walk with Jesus. Uh, I wanna take you back to a time in which uh, it was uh, probably early 2015. I was, I am and was very healthy mother of one child, married, she was 15. I work 40 hours a week as a social worker for a large dialysis company, very active, I enjoy walking, very, very healthy person. And so as part of a normal daily routine that we all have, I had noticed some changes that had begun to occur um, with my colon and kind of wondered what was going on and thought, hmm, okay, and met with a couple of doctors that I worked with and they were like, well, a little bit of blood in the stool um, may look like more than it is. Just kind of keep a watch on it. So over the next year, um, things began to change a little bit. I did end up seeing a colorectal surgeon, a nurse practitioner, and she thought maybe I had an issue with hemorrhoids. I have a tendency to work very hard outside pick up very large items, and I thought, well, maybe so. So she gave me some medicine and sent me home. And over that next year, things began to decline in relation to uh, my restroom use. And so I thought I needed to go back. I was at that point 46 years old, still very healthy. She examined me and said, I don't understand what's happening. But obviously, if you're back, something is very bad. And I said, well, you know, I think it's hemorrhoids. So if he does surgery on me, just tell him to band it and let's go on our way. So she came back in and she said, I did not realize how old you were. She was not being critical, but she said the colorectal surgeon wanted to do a colonoscopy. And I said, okay, I understand. So on June 13th of 2016, I went in for my colonoscopy. I was not frightened. I was not scared. My husband had used this colorectal surgeon and I was in recovery waking up and I woke up very happy and say, Hey, to my husband, how'd it go? And he said, you have cancer, probably two types. The surgeon kind of came running in because he wanted to be the one to tell me. They had found a golf ball sized tumor in my upper colon. And what had been impacting my uh, overall restroom use was a four inch tuba villus adenoma that was actually blocking my rectal area. So he immediately sent me for scans, came back and had a plan. He was like, we need to get one out first and then we'll go after the golf ball later on. But we have to see about the large one that's impacting your rectum. So we went home. The next day, interestingly enough, at the hospital, they had something called tumor board. Tumor boards only occur about every quarter at most hospitals. At this particular hospital, it was the day after my, sur after my colonoscopy. So that doctor called me, my colorectal surgeon, about 4 p.m. I was back at work. 
um, despite my hour and a half with him the day before, because he had trimmed up some of that area. And he said, you ready to go to surgery? And I said, when? He said, well, we've talked about you all day and you've been up in pictures, which was kind of embarrassing. But he said, the good thing about tumor board is the head of pathology is there. So we looked at your pathology and feel it's necessary that we go in and get that tumor, out, that rectal growth out of there immediately. And I said, let's do it. So the next day I went in and I had a surgery of about three and a half hours. My husband reports that during this time, he came out and said I was doing great, that things were going well, but they were kind of redoing my whole back end um, because they had to get that very large growth out. So after that, I woke up, felt good. I even remember laughing because I'm a person who always puts their makeup on and the doctor said I look like Johnny Depp because <laughs> my makeup had gone down my eye. And my biggest concern was, can I really go back to work tomorrow? He said, why don't you wait and see? And I was like, I feel good. He said, how about you push it till Monday, which was three days. And I said, okay. So I was still obviously feeling pretty good and went home, continued to recover, went back to work, felt good. No one had even known I was ill um, and went went back to my normal lifestyle. The doctor had planned for one month after that pathology came back, they had to send it off to another lab. And he said, well, let's see what the pathology states before I go in and do the other tumor, the golf ball. Because that would require what we call a colectomy where they take out part of your colon. And so during these times, for some reason, I had a memory during that last surgery. And at first I was very embarrassed, scared. I asked my husband one day, I said, did I have trouble during surgery medically? He goes, nope. I said, you did great. And he, he said, why? And I said, I don't know if it was a dream. I don't know if it was in surgery, after surgery, when it was. But I literally remember being at a well similar to what we think in the Bible, with a olive tree over it. And it was a round, a round well, stone well. And I was sitting on one side and Jesus was on the other side. And he was in his white robe and his hood was up. And all I remember is saying, I am scared. And he said, take my hand. So at that time we were on a very, uh, dirty, dusty road. The clouds were swirling. It almost looked like it was a storm. We were walking, holding hands. We turned over our shoulder and the Virgin Mother in her beautiful blue had her head bowed and was praying. At that point in time, the skies opened up, the most beautiful greens and yellows and, and the most vibrant colors came through. And that's all I remember. So during that time, he was with me. As I look back, um, because June 13th is a feast day for Catholic Church. It is St. Anthony's feast day. And a year before, and I bring this here, I had received in the mail from the St. Lawrence Seminary a St. Anthony prayer book that I'd been praying for more than a year. So that is now my feast day because that was the first day my cancers were found. Wow. Uh, on June, let's think, uh, one month later, then on July 15th, that same year, I went and had a colectomy. I was in the hospital for one week, up walking after two days. The doctor said I might lose 15 to 20 pounds and I'm not a very big person but I actually gained five pounds. He put me back together so well. So I never had any trouble after that surgery. The only trouble I had was our daughter turned 16. And after walking with Christ, I believe the devil invaded my home. We had told her that I had cancer. She said, I'm sorry. But she at that point kind of was a dead man walking at church, was not participating, actually left church. 
um, started running around, lying, um, just behaving very badly in relation to many things, sexually, smoking marijuana, um, fighting with us. Uh, it is hard to say that she was so angry that at one point she told me and her father that she would uh, dance the day we both died and she would celebrate on our graves. Oh. It was utter hell. I was well, but the devil was here. I asked many people to pray. I was not ashamed. I don't care. Pray, pray, pray. One night we had all gotten into it. I had sent her away because both my husband and I uh, literally wanted to pitch her out on the front steps permanently. She had asked to go into state custody like some children who have no knowledge. And her friend said, no cell phone and car there, you know. So I actually took holy water. And um, let me move this from my screen in case it's showing actually took holy water and blessed the room she was in and blessed the room that we were in. And not many months after that, did it feel like the devil left. Um, she has not returned to our church, but the anger subsided. The lying subsided. Um, I felt like the devil was very much here as I got closer to Jesus he was trying to pull us all apart and he was very active. I will, I will never deny that he was in my home. Um, she is now in college. She's going to graduate a year early. She comes to see us. She makes almost straight A's. She has a uh, great humor about her. And so God got her back for us. So even though I was well, my home was not well. And so I tell people, beware. When you take that step closer to him, that devil will be very strong in other areas and you must watch out for him. Mm -hmm. And so to this day, things are great. I continue to work uh, 40 hours a week. My husband's retired. He enjoys his life at home. Uh, church life is very important because every Sunday, that's when we bring back together the reason that we walk this path. And part of what I do is take care of patients on dialysis. And I believe that the Lord chose me to do that. And many of these patients have often said, oddly enough, even after my experience, one was dying and I told him he, I would pray for him. And he looked into my eyes and he said, I have a feeling your prayers are always heard. And I said, I don't know how you know that, but they are. Oh, that's beautiful that you can offer that to your patients. And, you know, you, you seem like it was so like, well, I had surgery. You don't sound like you were very afraid. I mean, were you, were you fearful during, before the major surgery? Or were you, do you think it was just like when you told Jesus you were afraid? Um, that was the only time and I wasn't awake. Um, five years earlier, my father had died of, uh, uh, would have been, I'm sorry, three years at that time, died of a cancer that just invaded his whole uh, abdominal area. And so when they said I had cancer, that was when I was scared because he died within one month of diagnosis. That's how bad his was. Oh my goodness. And so that really shocked me. But when I come back from CT and the doctor said, nope, it's all contained. I was never really scared. I was never really scared when my daddy died because we were raised to believe that we are here for a purpose in a short time and we are only here to do his will and then return to him. So I often tell people, why are we so sad except for our own selfish reasons when people leave if we know the joy that they will have with the good Lord? I was never scared. Wow. And this experience that you had in the OR, of course, I have to ask more about that. <laughs> um, and when people talk about Jesus, I'm like, I want to know every detail. Did he smell like, you know, Old Spice? Did he like, how? everyone seems uh, to just know Jesus when they see him. Like, you just knew it was him. Uh, I did. Um, you know, there was no smell. It was just sight and feeling of, peacefulness 
um, that hood was up. Um, I don't know if he had a beard. I, I just know there was some clarity in his eyes. I don't know all that. I, I don't remember all that. I just know it was him. Yeah. Um, the odd thing about walking with him and seeing the Virgin Mary, I could clearly make out what they were wearing and what was around, but I had no sense of anything about me, which is what we're always taught in the Bible. And there was no sense of what I was wearing, what I was looking like. There was no sense of anything. I was just holding his hand. Wow. What was it like? I mean, did you just feel, everyone says you feel love. I mean, how did it change your life having this? Because you were already a person of faith. So how did it change you having this experience? I guess it just reiterated that even in the most down times, that he is always there, that we're going to have hard times, but hold on tight because not only he, but his mother are praying for us. And I can tell you, I know people who are not of my faith wonder if Catholics honor the Virgin Mary idolizer. No, we don't. But just like he said at the wedding at Cana, listen to my mother and change the wine into great wine. We pray to her so that she prays to him. And most mothers prayers things that they want or need are fulfilled by their children and him as her son. And so I have found that those are unfailing prayers and that both are always there with us along with the Holy spirit, obviously, which I couldn't see, but obviously there. Amazing. So just, just peace and the vibrancy of colors, like people explain when they do have near death experiences, but I don't think that's what happened to me. Mm hmm. Yeah, people are having these experiences, regardless if I mean, some people are having them not even having surgery, they're they're having them. I don't know if that you consider that I mean, a vision technically you're awake. Um, or it could be God speaks to us in dreams sometimes. But you know, this was something that did happen when you were in surgery. So you never arrested or anything like that. Just, oh, blood pressures never even fell. Mm -hmm. um, didn't have any of those issues. Amazing. And oh, what a gift, what a gift, what a gift. And how are you doing now? Doing well. Um, I have no health problems. Um, I go in every six months for checks. Uh, the doctor that took care of me, I can say he too was a gift because the last time I went in for a colonoscopy, he said, ladies and gentlemen, this lady, uh, she is a great pro at this. And I went, yeah. Um, I've had about 13 of those procedures. And three years. And so anyone watching, don't be scared of a first time. Mm -hmm. And he said it was either this or a colostomy, which was permanent. Mm -hmm. And that was a real aha moment for me because in healthcare, there are some individuals out there who would have looked at my situation and not taken the five hours to reconstruct me, but just put a permanent colostomy on me and went on their way. Mm -hmm literally took care of me um, and was such a blessing. Not only saved my life, found it, but reconstructed me to a point that I'm just like everybody else. Oh, I'm so happy for you. You know, and obviously we're focusing on this, the supernatural blessing that you had in this interview, but as a nurse, <laughs> I do. I'm getting ready to turn 50 myself and uh, I get that birthday present, <laughs> the colonoscopy. But, um, you know, we used to see people in the OR all the time. I have to do this PSA, but um, people come in, they have not had their screenings and it can be catastrophic. You know, the key is finding it early and, you know, we, it's so important to get those screenings and you can't, don't be afraid of the prep. It's gotten better. It used to be worse <laughs> as far as, you know, now they can concentrate it and um, space it out. Um, but yeah, it's, it's so important. So please, please stay up to date on your screenings. Uh, it's actually the age is now 45, although not all insurance is covering until like at that age, but you, it's something we've got to really, and if you have family history, it's even earlier. So please talk about this with your physician. Um, and I'm so happy too, that things are better with your daughter. Um, you know, it is, it is something that happens sometimes when we get closer to Jesus, we can see 
we can see retaliation. We can see the devil fighting. You know, I've seen that even doing this podcast. So I feel, I don't know, I have a peace in Jesus. So he's stronger than all that. So, but uh, wonderful, wonderful. Um, anything else you want to add? For I do. In your and show? People, people are often embarrassed by bad things that occur within their family life, their work life. Never be scared to ask for others to pray with you. That does not mean you're weak. That does not mean you're imperfect. That means that you're human and that other people make decisions too that we, we can't control other people's behaviors. But I do believe that the more people that you have pray, the more chance you have that situations will turn around or at least give you more peace during the difficult time because that's when everyone is gathered as one praying for the same result. And we may not even know res what result. Um, I tell my patients all the time, when you can finally offer up your need for help and let go of, I want it to turn out this way, it usually turns out pretty good. Just quit trying to control the outcome. Jesus will do so. Wonderful. I bet you're the best social worker ever. So <laughs> thank oh, you. But I love my job. I do enjoy taking care of my patients. Oh, well, I know Maria speaks the highest of you. So thank you so oh, much for your time today. And I just wish you continued health and blessings with your family. So thank you, Jane. And uh, anyone out there, if you have a miracle that you would like to share, uh, reach out to me at everydaymiraclespodcast.com or my email, everydaymiraclespodcast at gmail.com. We're now on Spotify. We're on YouTube, iTunes, Stitcher. We're growing. So thank you so much for listening and God bless. Mm -hmm.